<laughs> Hi everybody, this is Ron Miller, and I'd like to welcome you once again to the Bishop's Corner here on the Annunciation Radio family of stations, WNOC 89.7 in the Greater Toledo area, WHRQ 88.1 in Sandusky, 89.5 WFOT in Mansfield, 90.9 WSHB in Willard, 89.9 WRRO in Bryan, and 104.1 WLBJ in Faustoria. Uh, there's a couple other stations in Northwest Ohio that carry the Bishop's Corner every week. 88.9 WJTA in Lipsick and 103.3 WSJG in Tiffin. Uh, the Bishop's Corner is heard every Thursday. It's broad, rebroadcast several times throughout each weekend. You can check the broadcast schedule by going to the Annunciation Radio website, which is www.annunciationradio.com. And we welcome, as always, Bishop Daniel Thomas to his show. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Good to be with you and our okay. listeners and viewers in this Lenten time. So yeah, and we should great to be here. Tell them also they can uh, download uh, the app. Absolutely. To the show from uh, the app uh, websites or the app stores, wherever they want to go. They can find us on many venues. We are we are worldwide <laughs> on the World Wide Web. So um, we welcome you, as always. And uh, I guess maybe before we get to a gospel or anything, do you have anything schedule-wise that you want to talk about? Sure, just a few things to keep our folks informed of activities and really my activities in the diocese and perhaps to help them understand a little more other responsibilities I have that maybe they are not aware of. Sure. And now and then, as you know, folks, I, I accept to be a speaker at certain things, and I was happy to accept an invitation to be a major speaker at the Bringing America Back to Life conference, which is held just outside of Cleveland in Independence, Ohio. That's going to be on Saturday morning, the 10th of March, and it's, it's obviously a, a tremendously pro-life event and an effort to both encourage and, and see how we can not even more bring our pro-life commitment to our society. Yeah. So I'm happy Wonderful. to do that. Uh, also then the following week on Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm asked to go to uh, Washington for USCCB meetings and I'll be there for two days. And I'm going to those meetings actually as the elected representative of our, all our bishops in Region 6. So Region 6 comprises the states of Michigan and Ohio. So every three years the bishops elect a representative of themselves to serve on the administrative committee and to act in their name in receiving the information and engaging in the administration of our bishops conference. So I'm happy to do that on their, okay. on their behalf. And then lastly that following Thursday, before the next show airs, Ron, yeah. I'll be very happy to meet as I do regularly with our religious superiors. So uh, since I've arrived in the diocese, it's been my joy to meet with the men and women religious who are represented here in the Diocese of Toledo. And we do that periodically, at least twice a year. We have an agenda, we meet together, we share lunch and talk, and we share all the things that are going on in the religious congregations as well as with the diocese. So it's always a blessing to engage with our consecrated religious mm -hmm. and how they're serving within the Diocese of Toledo. Wonderful. All right. Well, you're always busy. Well, <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> You've always got a lot going on. Uh, can we go to our gospel? Surely, please. All right. And we are going to read from the Gospel of John, a recent gospel. Uh, Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of Scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, many believe, began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. 
for Saul's vision. So this gospel, of course, from the third Sunday of Lent, puts us in mind of the temple, that is the physical temple, that Jesus drives the money changers from, yeah. but also the bodily temple, who was the person of God, Jesus himself, who would suffer, die, and rise. And I guess you know we could do a whole exegesis here, Ron, about the just anger of Jesus. And I'll bet some homilists did that on Sunday because people think of anger as a sin, but this was the just anger of Jesus because they were abusing the temple precincts. But I'd like to sort of move in a different direction and maybe something that people had not thought about. And that is because, in fact, Jesus drives what should not be there from the temple, but then he speaks of his own body. And I think Lenten time is a time where we invite Jesus to drive from our bodies, our minds, hearts, and souls, whatever is not from him and whatever should not be in the precinct, if you will, of our temple, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, our very bodies. Mm. So I would, I would invite the fact that, you know, Jesus, because he loves us so much, of course he can be justly angry at our sins. What should not be within the temple of our bodies, minds, hearts, or souls? So my humble suggestion here is preparing for Easter and preparing for Holy Week in this Lenten time. Each day, allow the Lord to enter into your temple and allow him, or better, invite him to drive from you whatever should not be in your temple. Wonderful. That's a great image. Okay, um, let's sneak in a question or two if we could. Uh, we have a question uh, uh, from Nate and St. Joseph's Mommy. Uh, question for Bishop Thomas. Is the following statement accurate or close to accurate? Uh, quote, concerning the Council of Nicaea and the Arian heresy, what happened? Why did Arius and so many other great thinkers misinterpret the identity of Christ? Because they applied Greek philosophical systems. The Father is not the Son when you understand the world through the eyes of Plato. Uh, through the lens of the Old Testament, we can understand that personhood, identity, character, and divinity in the case of Christ can extend from parent to offspring. This worldview is in no way threatened by the Arian perspective. It is far above it. Your thoughts? Well, Nathan, my first thought is that is a very dense and complicated question. Yeah. But I also know, Nathan, from your own social media and blog, I know you have a master's degree in theology from Lourdes University, and I would humbly suggest that the question is, is so particular, unfortunately, I would not be able in just a few sentences to answer it because I'm afraid our listeners and viewers would not have the really the tools that I'd have to provide to be able to more deeply understand all the categories that you list, especially, for example, who is Arius and you know what are these constructs that might be talked about. So my humble suggestion is, I, I don't mean to, to be a cop-out, Nathan, but I would invite you to speak perhaps to a priest or a theologian who you deeply respect and maybe enter into dialogue with them simply to see in your own discernment the answer to your question. So again, not a put-off, but I, I'm afraid that in, a, in two or three sentences, it would simply be impossible on a pro radio program to really get to the bottom of an answer. And, and, and over the years, we've had this situation before where you get have. something that it's a little hard in a 30-minute uh, thing to uh, address something that would take days to, <laughs> to really... And I'm grateful for yeah. all our questions, and I'm also yeah. grateful, Nathan, for yours. Uh, I think it would really have to be a 30-minute conversation yeah, together. Sure. And, and that's just not possible on a radio show yeah, like this. Yeah, great. So thank you, but Nathan. Thanks for the question. And prayers for that intention. And I'm going to sneak one more in, if we could, um, which is from Jane. A uh, question for Bishop Thomas. I would like the bishop to address the concerns in this article. The church should promote what it teaches. Uh, the article she cites says, uh, quote, The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, USCCB, and Catholic Relief Services, CRS, have once again written to Congress requesting robust funding for two agencies deeply committed to the promotion and distribution of contraception, one of which provides millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood. Uh, despite acknowledging in the letter that uh, Planned Parenthood and Global Fund are highly involved in the distribution of contraception, neither the USCCB nor CRS asked for the cessation of those immoral activities in its bid for Congress 
to provide American tax dollars to both projects. Thank you, Jane, for that question, and I, I hope you understand, too, that everything you read, you cannot believe. Because remember, I always say we believe half of what we read yeah. and none of what we hear. Right. So I can tell you that the Lepanto Institute, which in fact is the site from which you take the article and the letter, the Lepanto Institute has been notorious for being a singular voice against CRS, Catholic Relief Services. And in fact, back in 2015, there was a statement made to CRS friends and supporters by the then chair, Archbishop Paul Coakley, and he really qualified a number of the things that were necessary, not the least of which were launching a new required course entitled Catholic Identity, the Board of Directors given new guidance to staff and selection of activities carried out in programs, and the Board of Directors approving the creation of an advisory committee on Catholic identity. So I would invite you not to simply take at face value what you have read, and I think we'd have to be very, very careful to back up with actual facts the letters that would come in particular from that source. And you can understand it's not uncommon that when something goes out, people believe it to be true, they believe it to be the fact, and it needs to be proven or disproven. And unfortunately, that source has been notorious in its negativity. And, and on a bigger scale, these days, the whole social media thing, whatever, has just exacerbated that problem. That you can see all kinds of things online from all kinds of perspectives, and if you don't know who wrote it or where it came from, you just can't believe it. And, and the difficulty is, as I always say, well, there's a commercial when people are buying automobiles, show me the car facts. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I want to say, show me the facts. So yeah. it's easy, I think it's a little bit too easy for us sometimes to become riled by reading something yeah. which may, in effect, not be altogether true. There may be pieces of truth, but it may not be altogether true. Yeah. All right, good. Thank All you. All right, thanks. And we do have to take a quick break, Bishop. So. Folks, uh, hang around with us. Don't go anywhere because the bishop's going to be back because we have lots of questions. We have to get to them, Ron. So stay right with us. We'll be right back. Giving with faith, hope, and love. Hello, everyone. This is Bishop Daniel Thomas, the bishop of the Diocese of Toledo. This is our theme for the 2018 Annual Catholic Appeal, reflecting the spirit in which we are all called to share our gifts with those around us. Here in the Diocese of Toledo, your gifts help the less fortunate, support parish programs, sustain our clergy, provide for the formation of seminarians and deacons, and so much more. Please give generously to our annual Catholic Appeal. Thank you so much. And we are back here at the Bishop's Corner with Bishop Daniel Thomas. And folks, so we are always anxious to get your questions. Uh, the, there's a very easy way for you to do that. Uh, you can just go to AnnunciationRadio.com and click on the Bishop's Corner or just Google the Bishop's Corner if you want to and a little template will pop up and you can put your uh, question right in there. Just type it in. It'll get right to the Bishop. Uh, the Bishop does ask that maybe you give him your first name, the town you're from, the parish you're from, something like that. So he has uh, some idea who he's speaking with. Uh, we do our very best to get all of the questions on the air every show. Sometimes we have too many uh, and we can't do that. But if you keep listening, we do carry them over show to show. And there's probably a very good chance you'll get to hear the bishop. And Ron, we get excellent questions. We get nothing but excellent questions. <laughs> some of them are a little too deep to deal with all the time. But <laughs> so we, we do, they get great questions. And we are going to go to Sue, uh, who says, Dear Bishop, uh, why isn't the diocese doing more about human trafficking? I was at a human trafficking prayer breakfast recently, and clergy from multiple faiths were represented, but none of the Catholic clergy were on the dais. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Sue. Well, first of all, the, since I arrived, we established a commission for human trafficking. So we actually have a subcommittee on human trafficking, which involves a number of people, clergy, laity, and consecrated religious who are actively involved in making every effort to stop human trafficking. So the reality is, in fact, we are doing something on human trafficking. Second, there may not have been a priest or a deacon on the dais, and I can tell you that may also have been because on the one hand, and I know some folks, they simply were not aware of an event, maybe they were not even invited to the event, 
Or on the other hand, because we have so many limited clergy, it may be that they were otherwise occupied with ministerial responsibilities. So the reality is that we are doing something, we hope to do more, and we can never do enough to stop the scourge of human trafficking as we see recently, especially in our community. And thank God the community seems to be stepping up even more to work yeah, against it. Scourge is the right word. It, it's, Absolutely. Uh, where I was recently, I mean, it's a terrible problem in, in another country. and. And it's all over the world. It just Absolutely. It is everywhere. And it's rampant here in our own northwest Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Mary from St. Joseph. Dear Bishop Thomas, I know that there are many approved apparitions of the Blessed Mother throughout history, continuing into modern day. Uh, my question is this. What is the protocol to follow when someone believes they received visual or auditory messages from the Blessed Mother, Jesus, or saints? Uh, what steps should be followed by that person or their friends and family members who are informed of the phenomenon? Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. So for, for anything that might be a supernatural phenomenon, like the possible apparition of Our Lady, we would think, for example, of Our Lady of Guadalupe or Lord. The account of the vision and any locutions that accompany them are always submitted to the Church for investigation. And then there is a thorough process of the Church herself to verify what allegedly took place. And then, of course, this is to be in conformity, obviously, with the gospel given to us by our Lord Jesus and the tradition of the church. So once some supernatural event is deemed uh, possible to have happened, then it is naturally brought to the church to determine whether or not it is authentic. And there are positive criteria, for example, moral certainty, a moral certainty, which means that the private revelation and the existence of that revelation have, are, are very serious and the nature of the message. It might mean that there are personal qualities that a, the person claiming it would have to be, of course, be investigated. Their balance, psychological balance, moral life, honesty, sincerity, obedience to the church, an evaluation of the content of the revelations themselves. What were they? Freedom from any theological error. And the revelation, of course, would have to result in some healthy devotion and spiritual fruit in people's lives. And we know authentic visions always lead to that kind of fruit. Then, of course, there would be negative criteria. For example, glaring errors in regard to facts from one person to the next. Doctrinal errors according to what is expressed about God or the Blessed Virgin or the Holy Spirit, for example. Any kind of pursuit of financial gain in relation to the alleged event. Any gravely immoral acts committed by the persons associated regarding this supernatural event, and any psychological disorders or tendencies on the part of the persons or persons associated. So you can see it's a, it's a very serious process, and it's something which the Church, of course, cannot take lightly, because we have, in fact, authenticated supernatural occurrences throughout history which we encourage yeah. and which, of course, we support. So I hope that's helpful as an answer. And, and I might be reading into it a little bit, but I also think maybe I'm reading into it a little bit that she's almost, is she insinuating that maybe she's someone she knows or herself or something is having this and she's asking, like, where do I go? Who do, who do I go see? Is, um, I, maybe I'm reading into it, but I simply I, don't know because there's no real clarity in the in the question. Yeah. But Mary, if you do know someone, or if you yourself might believe that, then of course the very first place to go would be to the church. So the first person would be to your parish priest, and then that of course would be presented to the diocese wherever you are. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. And we're going to go to Colleen from Saint. Uh, uh, is it Aloysius Church in Bowling Green? St. Aloysius. It? Aloysius. <laughs> uh, is it spelled wrong or am I just not? Yeah, I, don't know. I think it's I think it's, it's correct. It's me. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the problem here. Okay. St. Aloysius dear, Bowling Green. Aloysius. Okay, dear Bishop Thomas, I miss the Catholic Chronicle. I really enjoyed reading about things going on in the diocese. It was very well written and made me feel connected to other parishes. I know that I can look at the diocesan website, but it isn't the same as picking up the Chronicle at our parish. I also know the cost was an issue. 
is there any chance with the, that the Chronicle or some other type of publication can come back to help with communication within the diocese. I really enjoy listening to the Bishop's Corner. Thank you, Bishop Thomas, for all the ways you reach out to Catholics in Northwest Ohio. Thank you, Colleen. Colleen, thanks for listening to the Bishop's Corner. Thanks so much for your desire for more information and what a gift. Of course, you realize and you, you hint at the reality that the Catholic Chronicle, when sadly it had to go away, there were, it was only about a 20 to 28 page uh, edition, which was only published 11 times a year. So Colleen, it wasn't even monthly. And I think we also would have to recognize in an age of extraordinary news, in fact, it wasn't news by the time it was published. Much of it was old and really already passe in many, many ways. At the time as well, you should know that when it went away, there were less than a thousand households that subscribed to it and only a few perhaps thousand more people who have really looked at it. And I can tell you when it went away, for example, the Diocesan website had a 27,000 page view over three months. So now, after it's gone away, and that was 2016, I can tell you, for example, one post on my Facebook page can get as many as 25,000 reach. So I hope you understand, Colleen, that in fact, that was really a, a very meager and not effective use of our resources, either personnel or monetary. And now, and I know you mentioned the website, but I hope you know, Colleen, that we have upped our game, so to speak, on our nuncius. So there are things which are relevant about parishes. We're trying to bring news from various parishes into our nuncius uh, publications. And we're on Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Facebook. So I, I really do believe that we need to to step forward, and as I said to some folks who lamented the passing of the Chronicle, I said, you know, I would encourage you, and if you can't, your family, or if your family can't, your parish, to help you get an iPad and to really be current. And I can tell you, I know 70-some and 80-some-year-olds who are on their iPads and phones looking at this information from the diocese on Twitter, Instagram, sure. and on Facebook. So I invite you, Colleen, to those and I encourage you, if you want to help us to get that out, please contact our communications office because I'm delighted for the interest in getting our diocesan communications known. And we always want the good news of what's going on in our parishes and elsewhere to be well communicated. Okay, great. Let's sneak one more in, Bishop. Uh, Susan at St. Gerard in Lima. Dear Bishop, I was just wondering how many languages you speak. <laughs> I recall that you lived in Rome. I also went to Our Lady of Guadalupe Mass last year and noticed how well you spoke Spanish. Uh, thank you for all you do for our diocese. Thank you, Susan. Well, thank you, Susan. I wish I spoke one language well. <laughs> Obviously, I try to speak English because I lived in Italy and had the blessing of being there for a number of years. I, I learned to speak Italian. I'm able to cover the, the celebration of the sacraments and preaching with a text in Spanish. And, of course, to try to read something in French or German. But speaking, and that's what you say, how many languages do you speak? And my response to that would be none well. So there we are, Susan. Thank you so much. <laughs> so how many was that again now? One, zero. two, three, four? <laughs> That's so, zero. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, we don't have, we've got maybe 30, 40 seconds before we need a prayer and a blessing. Uh, anything on last second you want to talk about? Well, simply again to encourage our people in this season of Lent because what a gift, folks. We get these 40 days huh? to, to look inwardly, to be honest with ourselves to take, uh, if you will, an assessment of where we are spiritually and ask the Lord for the grace. You know, when we receive ashes on Ash Wednesday, we hear one of two things. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you will return. What a sobering reality that, you know, this life will end. And the other that we may have heard on Ash Wednesday, repent and believe in the gospel. So Lent is always about repentance, turning away from whatever is sinful and turning toward the Lord, toward salvation. So I simply invite you, dig into Lent and pray that I can too. Great. Can we get a prayer and a blessing? Sure. Let's pray the prayer from this last Sunday that we celebrated in Lent. Let us pray. O God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you, Bishop, as always. Ron, thank you to you, Amen. to our listeners, our viewers, and continued blessings for a holy season of Lent. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next week right here at the Bishop's Court.